I'm going to call the regular meeting of the Board of Commissioners to order. Uh, I know the, it's kind of loud in here. I'll, hopefully we can get the, um, microphone, or the speakers worked on just a little bit. Anyway, I'm going to call the June 21st meeting to order at this point in time. I'd ask for everybody to stand for the presentation of colors by Cub Scout Pack 888 Forest Hill United Methodist Church. Please join us in the Pledge of Allegiance. Scout salute. I pledge, pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God. Indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Two. Prayer. This time I call on Deputy Luce for the invocation. Gracious Heavenly Fathers, with bold assurance we come before you throne tonight through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, I ask, I ask now that this time we are called to pray for those that are in your human government who are over us that you've established. Uh, the book of Peter says we're to pray for those in authority over us, and Timothy says we're to pray for those in authority over us so we might lead godly, peaceable lives. Father, just ask now that you just bless this gathering that everything that's done honor and glorify you and honor and glorify your Son, Christ. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Amen. Now, if the young men would come forward and introduce yourself to us in the audience, I certainly appreciate it. When you finish, if you'll go to your left, my right, and Commissioner Carruth will be passing you out a pen. You can pull down the microphone a little bit so we can all hear you and make certain your parents hear you. My name is Jake Haynes, and I go to, I'm in third grade, and I go to Carl A. Fair Elementary. Thank you, Jake. If you'll go over and see Commissioner Cruz. I am Alex Gaines. I go to third grade, and I go to Carl A. Fair Elementary. Thank you, Alex. If you'll go over and see Mr. Cru Commissioner Cruz. I'm Wesley Haynes. I go to Carl A. Fair. I'm in first grade. Thank you, Ms. Wesley. If you'll go over and see Commissioner Cruz. Thank you all very much for coming out. We have before us the agenda, and I call all the commissioners' attention to uh, their supplement on the very back of the printed paper that we have is an additional closed session meeting uh, as it relates to location or expansion of business or industries, including agreement on a list of economic incentives that may be offered during negotiations, as well as supplemental information uh, with the uh, agenda that we have before us with the additions. Is there any um, amendments or changes? Do we have a motion to approve the agenda as presented? Amen. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Motion carries. <laughs> the uh, next matter that we have is under three, or is under D, is informal public comments. And this time it's, uh, we have some yellow cards filled out that you have three minutes to speak. I would call the first is Mr. Jeff Daniels. Mr. Daniels, if you'll please let us know who you are, where you live, and you have three minutes, sir. Yes, sir. My name is Jeff Daniels. I live at 2875 Eagle View <coughs> Place here in Concord, North Carolina. Good evening. Dear Mr. Chairman and fellow commissioners, I stand before you not just, just as the owner of Bella, who was unlawfully shot, and killed a few short weeks ago. I stand before you as a concerned Cabarrus County citizen, taxpayer, and voter. 
When I left to take my family out to dinner that fateful night on April 29th, I returned to the shock and horror of learning that our beloved Bella had been killed. While we're sorry that Bella and Jackson managed to escape our yard, it was not uncommon for us to let them out in the yard. And in the four years that we had Bella in our family, we'd never had a single incident. When we returned that night, it was clear from the break in the wood that the hole was created from the outside. What is even more disturbing, however, is what began with a simple question, why, has revealed a pattern of deliberate indifference inside the Cabarrus County Sheriff's Department. I say that not to engage in adversarial speech. I say that in hopes that the pattern of deliberate indifference ends here. It is my highest hope that the Board of Commissioners will support Chairman White and, true to, and stand true to his words. In an e email last month, Chairman White stated, and I quote, the bottom line, as I am concerned, is to get as best of an understanding that I can about what happened and what can be done to eliminate or reduce the likelihood of this occurring in the future. If I'm not willing to review and assess situations or occurrences, then we are not getting better, end quote. I'm pleased to hear that you're committed to reviewing, assessing, eliminating, or reducing the likelihood of this occurring in the future. That is something that the Mr. Chairman reaffirmed during the press conference. However, this is not an isolated incident, and a review must be, and a review must include independent, outside experts. During the press conference last month, Mr. Chairman began by stating we're very sorry for what took place that night. However, the press conference did more to raise questions than it did to answer them. Many of the responses to questions included statements like, I cannot comment on that at this time. I do not know the answer to that question right offhand. That's something that we really haven't discussed. We've tried to get that information. We don't have it at this time. In fact, Chairman White spoke on behalf of the Board of Commissioners and told the media that the Board will continue the investigation and continue excuse me, to verify information. We've not been contacted to discuss these issues. The media has not been contacted with answers to their questions. The taxpayers of Cabarrus County have not seen further action. In response, we have formed an organized and organized a group of concerned voters. In just five short weeks, we have attracted approximately 1,000 local members. Could I just please finish just 30 more seconds, sir? Sure. Thank you so much. Justiceforbella.org is a grassroots organization dedicated to reforming animal care and control in Cabarrus County through the use of empirically proven cost-effective cost -effective methods that have already been ended shelter killing and reformed animal control operations in other cities. Our goal is simple, stop the taxpayer funded killing of 80% of Cabarrus County's animals and reform animal control operations through new policies and procedures and mandatory training in animal behavior and non-lethal methods of capture. <clears throat> we will not go away quietly. We will only become stronger and louder. We will be back and we will be heard respectfully. We'll see you next month, commissioners. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next matter we have is Mrs. Juba, Jessica Juba, if you'll please come forward. Uh, I'm Jessica Juba, resident of Concord, 2875 Eagle View Place. What happened to Bella is tragic enough, but now she has become a symbol of something even bigger. This was not an isolated incident. What Bella did was bring attention to an animal control department that is broken and a sheriff's department that lacks both leadership and compassion. What Bella did for this county in death, we will equal by honoring in her life and the lives of every animal that has fallen before her and after her. My question to you this evening is will you stay true to your words and join the ranks of other progressive communities, accomplishing great reforms, some of which are right here in North Carolina. This is something to be proud of, and of that is something to campaign for this November, or will you just go back to business as usual? We will be updating the public on those very questions, and we will keep scorecards for every elected official and public servant and where they stay on these very issues. With the committed support of national advocacy groups across North Carolina and across the country, we will continue to expose the flaws in this system. It is our sincere desire, however, that we can work together with the Board of Commissioners to make the necessary changes. I know deep down in your hearts that you want what is best for this county as well. Nobody likes the image of our county right now. That is not a perception of a or a reality to be proud of. Let us get past pointing fingers and bring the community together to solve these issues. 
In five short weeks, we have gained the support of over 1,000 citizens from Cabarrus County, 2,400 citizens from Charlotte-Mecklenburg, and another 2,000 from other counties in North Carolina, and thousands of other people from different states across this country. And that was accomplished alone by social networking. As we launch our website and campaign this week and work with our board of directors and advisory committee consisting of former county commissioners, local business leaders, concerned citizens, <coughs> animal welfare experts, and animal law attorneys, that support will continue to grow at a record pace. <clears throat> this is an election issue. We will continue to make it an important campaign issue. A lot can happen between now and November, but what you do from this day forward will determine not only how this county is perceived, but how the citizens of this county will vote in November. Telling the truth and doing the right thing is always the easiest and best thing to do. It is much harder to cover up failures than it is to address them as the opportunities that they are, opportunities to improve the welfare of the people of Cabarrus County and the animals that they love. What we cannot do, however, is count on the very people that have created this problem to be the ones to fix it. The Animal Protection and Preservation Advisory Committee that has been charged with these issues did not even meet in 2009. They are not committed to saving lives or finding solutions. They are there are independent experts like the No-Kill Advocacy Center, Humane Society of the United States, and Professor William Reppy of the Duke Animal Law Center right here in North Carolina. They must be the ones to review animal control operations and make recommendations. Anything else is truly an outrage. The citizens of Cabarrus County want change, and that change must include the review and recommendations of experts that have achieved great success with counties just like ours. Something good can come from this. this there's a lesson for all of us here. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. The next is Mrs. Melissa Fassett. Mrs. Fassett, if you'll introduce yourself and where you reside, and you're going to be talking about Bella and practices of animal control, I believe. Yeah. Thank you, ma'am. Um, I don't have a prepared speech. Uh, my name is Melissa Fassett. I live at 3597 Odell School Road in Concord, 28027. Um, I'm a volunteer. I work for Concord Engineering. Um, Back to the volunteering, I volunteer for rural transport. Um, they transport animals out of the south, out of high kill shelters. I spend every weekend, or every other weekend at least, sometimes even more than that, and I transport animals to a safety zone, to a place where they're not going to be killed. They're not going to be put into gas chambers. They're not going to be killed. They will find homes for them. They test these animals, and they make sure that they're not going to be hurt. Um, I volunteer as a scout mom. I um, am raising an Eagle Scout who is working on his project, working with the spay and neuter of Cabarrus County. It's got to start with education. Um, spending all these tax dollars on a kill shelter right here in Cabarrus County is not benefiting anybody. I have three kids at home that I'm raising, and the incident with Bella, they read that, and that was appalling to them. I include them in everything I do as far as information, learning, giving them the information out there to have a better America. As they grow up, they are our next generation. When they found out that we had a kill shelter here in Cabarrus County and that we kill 80% of our animals, they couldn't perceive that. They couldn't perceive that because they come with me every other week and pick up these animals and rescue them, sometimes 80 in a weekend, and we transport them 60 to 150 miles, and it's a, a group of us, a team, and we spend our own money to get these animals to where they're going. So I'm asking you guys to take a look at how Cabarrus County runs their shelter. If, if we're about saving the animals, let's save them. Let's not kill them. They're worth saving. They're they could be used in many different ways, <laughs> and killing them is not the way I want to spend my tax dollars. I'd much rather spend extra in my tax dollars, so it's less transports that I have to do. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. One thing that makes it very difficult is that we have been, uh, a lawsuit has been discussed that we are going to get sued on, so I, you know, it's tough to make comments when we've been told we're going to be sued about this matter. So. Um, anyway, the next matter we have is Tracy Dozenberry. Mrs. Tracy, if you'll please introduce yourself and let us know what you would like to talk about. Hi, I'm Tracy Dozenberry with Douglas Development. I'm at 2026 um, 
Timbers Hill Road in Richmond, Virginia. I'm here just to talk about item G3 on the um, agenda. I didn't know if there'd be a time later, so I just signed up to talk about it. Um, I just wanted to ask you to please um, approve this reservation of capacity certificate for our Forest Park Crossing community. It's something we've been working on for a long time. It's going to be a $7.8 million investment in the county. And um, we are willing to pay our fee up front. It's a small, low density community, and there's a proven <coughs> demand for the units. So we would just like to see you approve that certificate tonight. And I'm here if you have any questions when the item comes up. Thank you, ma'am. Mm -hmm. One thing that I uh, passed over is the approval and correction of minutes. We do have the minutes found on page four. Uh, these are minutes from May 3rd, May 17th, May 25th, and May 26th. Uh, we have a motion to approve the minutes as they were presented. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor say aye. aye. All opposed. Motion carries. Uh, under the consent agenda, F1 through F11, do we have a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Next matter we have is G1, is the uh, FY 2011 Cabarrus County budget. Uh, I will now turn it over to Mr. Day. Well, the items in the agenda uh, under this section reflect the discussions that the board has made, the changes to the five-year plan. There's a list of um, other changes uh, on page let's see, <coughs> 156. Um, as well to reflect again the actions that the board has taken and another anything that's happened uh, uh, with the budget in between the time of a meeting and the time the new budget is adopted. There are various five-year plan options uh, and again you don't have to choose one. These are all the, the different scenarios that the, the board was interested in, in seeing and of course this becomes a planning tool. And that's followed by the board budget ordinance, again, reflecting the discussions the board has held to this point. And we're happy to answer any questions that you might have. As we're closing down 2009-2010 budget, how much are we over budget for 2009-2010? Uh, I can't think of a year that we've ever been um, over the budget because that would be illegal. Okay. Well, I mean, we, <laughs> I mean, there's been discussions about we running a budget deficit, and we've we have not run a budget deficit in 2000. Uh, no, and I haven't seen the projections of how much what we think the year is going to end with. Can anyone answer that question, um, Kalisha or Pam? Kalisha Kennedy is the budget manager. As of today, we are right on track with. Um, the amended budget as adopted for 2010. Okay. And so we're right on track okay. with the adjustments. So we don't have a budget deficit? No. Okay. The things that we did earlier in this year was in preparation of what we're anticipating for reduced revenues for correct. the coming year. That's correct. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Do we have any discussion amongst the board that we have right now? I know that um, I've been uh, and myself have been contemplating and looking over COLA and, and I know that when I was doing some research today in regards to COLA, um, we have looked at the uh, years, the, there's a table of years in regards to the Bureau of Labor, I believe it is, Labor Statistics, and for 2009 that number came up to 2.7 percent which we talked about and we round down to 2.5 percent, is that correct? Right. Okay. Um, that's consistent with the policy that's been in place for the past 15 years or so. It is rounded down to the nearest half percent based on the previous calendar year. And that's that it, and every year it consistently uses the same number that comes from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. Right. Uh, and then we also have in here um, potential for merit raises if someone qualifies. Is that correct? Correct. There, there is a, a program of performance evaluation. In fact, it was just revamped um, this year uh, and uh, re reviewed and improved. Uh, that's, there's a scoring uh, that occurs uh, based on uh, that person's performance, and there's a um, modified table uh, for merit raises that is included in the budget. In fact, I guess you just adopted it in the uh, 
um, consent agenda that reduces the amount so that there's a maximum of two and a half percent. It's almost impossible to get the two and a half percent. There may be somebody that gets it, but the, the typical range is in the kind of the middle to um, uh, three quarter up to the top or three quarter percentile. It, it certainly are not all in the top, and it's very rare that they actually are. But the, the short answer is it's all based on performance, and there is a very formal program for that that's done on the anniversary of the employees. Okay. Are there any other questions? Just a couple, I guess, on that same thing with the merit. And how do we, and I know that the original figure was 700000 for this year, and in this document that you've got with the adjustments, it's 350. How do we, you know, it's almost impossible for somebody to get two and a half percent of the full two and a half percent or a full five percent before how how do we figure up your do we take basically like a roll in five years to see what the as far as the percentages so we know how much to budget for that since it's uh well we have a sliding scale in previous years it was actually paid for out of lapsed salaries mm -hmm. and in fact the budget ordinance uh, specifically made that provision and has for uh, a number of years um we, we don't experience a lot of um, the vacancies anymore, so there is a very limited amount okay. of lap salaries. And lap salaries, for anybody who doesn't know, that's uh, it's a, the accrued amount of money that you save by having vacancies at any time uh, during the course of the year. Uh, so with, without that being a reliable number, um, uh, the staff made some estimates. Okay. <laughs> that was a question that I had thought about in just as think out loud here but is that is it with the merit almost making it in the future and it's something I think we have to talk about outside of the budget process but uh, Mr. Chairman we talked about it a little bit earlier today is that base it on when we do you know we have to just like we do with our fund balance is that when we get to our audit at the 18 month point at the beginning of the fiscal year so in December when the audit's done for this past year and then we put above 15 percent goes in capital reserve fund is use those excess funds to fund the merit program. And what it would create is almost an incentive based quasi, if you have something government called profit sharing, but almost a quasi thing where it would reward coming in, you know, below the budget uh, in, in, uh, with, a, rewards with a surplus, if you had a surplus. And that would come out above, you know, the first thing that would come off that would be to fund the merit program. For the next year, I mean, that's just thought of. You know, I know we use lap salaries in the past. I'm sure that's something we want to look at. It must be something discussion outside of this. But the other question I had too is on the uh, that is on the changes, and because I don't think it was in the original budget with the retirement incentive that you had talked about. I think with us is that where was that money coming up from before? Was that out of fund balance or? Well, I don't know that I can answer the question. I'm not sure how many people have retired and have gotten <laughs> that up to this okay. point. I guess we put that in effect, I guess, beginning about March. Okay. Um, and I honestly am not aware of whether whether anyone has taken advantage of it at this point. Okay. Um, so that was in the, is that something that was added, though, in for the changes? Or? It, uh, is there anyone out there, the staff, that can address that? I'm not sure there is. I was looking at the... For, for those, uh, I mean, for, for those that have retired, of course, yeah. there's a lot of salary, right, for, yeah. for those people, so I'm sure okay. that, that was used. Yeah, that's what I was wondering about, because it looks like it was something that, with the savings, that we put $250,000 towards the retirement incentive, and I didn't know before that was budget, that was not budgeted before that. That was. That is correct. Okay. When we were uh, going through the budget process, we were not aware of how many people might potentially be okay. taking advantage of the situation, and when the merit was changed, from 5% to 2.5%, that generated about $350,000. So we inquired as to how many people who have potentially signed up, and there were a significant number of people who have signed up and potentially could retire and be eligible for this incentive. And once we calculated what that incentive would be, if those individuals did, we used some of that excess money from that merit money to cover that because we would not have any lab salary to do that. So that's why that adjustment was changed. We did not expect as many people to sign up for the plan as have, and we still have nine more days for them to sign up. So that is an estimate based on the information that we had thus far. Okay. okay. Uh, 
I, my position may not be a popular one with the staff, but um, I, I'm a little concerned with the message that we give to the public when we, in these difficult times in the private sector, people are losing jobs and certainly not getting pay raises, that we are doing things that, 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 that are not totally necessary at this time. And I, I'm, I'm a little curious as to the COLA, since I know that Social Security was zipped. And I don't know why they ba they base the um, that how that's different from the, the cola how why that would be a different and, and figure why one is zero and one is two and a half and I don't know what period of time is used for determining that either I'm not familiar with not all that familiar with Social Security yet but, uh -huh. um, but we use a calendar year as as the chairman had discussed earlier um, so. You know, and we can certainly provide that information for everybody. There's a list that goes back, I think, to around 1900, <laughs> listing all the, the what the CPI has been for each of those years, and that's what's used. One thing I found, Commissioner Minot, when I was doing the research is when I typed in uh, cost of living adjustment 2010, it kicked me to the Social Security website, and it said for <clears throat> 2010, January 2010, there was no increase in Social Security. And it said that uh, it referenced the Bureau of Labor Statistics saying that from the third quarter of 2008 until the third quarter of 2009, since there was not an increase, then January of 2010, there would not be a cost of living adjustment. Um, if you go to a table on the Bureau, Bureau of Labor Statistics, it has from 1913 until the present, and for 2009, it showed an increase of 2.7 percent from January to, to December of 2009. It also had a couple of months in Jan of 2010, and that's where the that's where I saw the 2.7 percent. So that's that's the only explanation I have is that we're looking at the policy of this board looks at year to year, January to December. Social Security looks like it seems it was end of 2008, third quarter of 2008 till 2009, which last year our COLA was, was zero, I believe. Um, if I could pull it up, I could, I don't know how to get on the internet from here, but um, anyway. That's what I, that's what I was, that is the only, Difference that I could tell. Tell uh, this this three hundred and fifty thousand. That's merit, strictly merit. That's not the cover. Correct. correct. Okay. Right. And what I had uh, to point out um, for the five-year plan, <coughs> A, B, C, and D. A and B include a additional quarter cent sales tax that would have to be passed by the voters. And C and D <coughs> took that out so that if a sales tax was not passed, it um, shows what the tax rate, how the tax rate would change um, to compensate for not having a quarter cent sales tax. So for people who would, you can pull this up on our website and look at the five-year plan, you can look at the whole budget, actually. Um, but I wanted to point that out because that is in there and, and that had been included previous years and we had not called for the referendum at, at any point. Um, I think took some hits or comments were made this year about not planning very well. In reality, it was planned for, it was just something that wasn't undertaken. So. That was the reason for the extra. I know you guys remember that, but that was the reason for uh, C and D shows what the impact on the property tax rate would be if there is not a quarter additional quarter cent sales tax. Is there any other? Discussion from this board, Commissioner um, 
mine I just pulled up under the Social Security.gov. It's uh, cost of living adjustments, Social Security.gov. Um, why is there no COLA for 2010 by law? Social Security and Supplemental Security income benefits increase automatically each year if there is an increase in the Bureau of Labor Statistics Consumer Price Index for Urban Wage Earners and Clerical Workers, parentheses, CPI-W in parentheses, for the third quarter of the last year to the corresponding period for the current year. This year, there was no increase in the CPI-W for the third quarter of 2008 to the third quarter of 2009. If there is no COLA, your Social Security and SSI benefits will remain the same. Um, <clears throat> that was under the cost of living adjustment under Social Security. And then, if I could get to it, it's... Uh, Statistics, U.S. Department of Labor, from 1913 to 2010, 2009, it was 2.7%. In uh, 2008, it was 0.1. <coughs> um, so that's where I was. And then we ran, then I believe our policy is to round down. 2010, it hasn't completed the year, so it's not going to show. But that's January to December is what. So the Social Security Administration is looking a year later than what we're a, looking at. A year earlier, but it's third quarter to third quarter, 2008 to 2009. Okay. So that extra quarter, when we roll that out, we actually just want to create it. Right. And 2008 is actually 4.1%. 2009 calendar year is 0.1%. And 2009, or excuse me, 2007 is 4.1. 2008 it was 0.1. Mm -hmm. And 2009 it looks like it's 2.7. Okay. <clears throat> um, in regards to the merit, if we were to take it out, I, I think we need, you know, in taking it out, we need, if you're reducing it, you got to place it somewhere else. And I think that, uh, that if we were to do that, uh, it's, we're limited in where it goes, um, either cutting down on, if we're repaying anybody in travel expenses, that would certainly reduce our expenses in the long run. <clears throat> um, there is the detention officers. We can bring them online a little bit earlier, I believe. Uh, that would reduce our expenses for next year. Uh, we just bring it into this year. <clears throat> uh, so there's, there's some alternatives there. Mr. Chairman, one other thing is that I know you understand that that you never know what's going to happen until it's done, but the budget negotiations are continuing in Raleigh in the conference committees. And I know that there's been some, you know, things are continuing to decay as far as revenue pictures are concerned. And uh, do we, if we did that, do we sort of appropriate, put it in our contingency fund to hold it in case there's some last minute cut from Raleigh that we need to to cover? That's certainly something we can do. Yeah. Um, I don't know how much how much we're dependent on the state budget being passed. I know that's going to affect Medicaid, but we don't. Yeah. We're no longer responsible for Medicaid. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they can. I know there were some rumors about them taking sales tax or lottery or, some lottery proceeds again. And yeah, well, that's kind of up in the air on what's going to happen to lottery. The Senate and the House have different versions. Um, of it, one in the Senate just provides some additional flexibility in how the, the funding is spent. Uh, but there's been some discussion recently about pulling out some of that money, reducing the amount that goes to the counties uh, and the state using it uh, to put in a classroom. And who knows? <laughs> Those uncertainties, and we have no idea how much those uncertainties will total if they come. Um, 
if they if we should go ahead and vote for the merit pay this evening, uh, including that, then uh, you limit where or you create the situation of where would we get those shortfalls if they are shortfalls. So I would prefer personally to um, uh, eliminate the mer the merit uh, pay for this year and have that money in reserve in case we do come up with some things from the state that we need to find, plug in from some other area. Commissioner Privet, what are your thoughts? Well, one of my concerns in looking at the five-year program that uh, we're already building in a tax <coughs> increase and the economists uh, by and large agree that uh, and we're looking at the long term about uh, unemployment and what have you. And I'm wondering how can we uh, justify saying we're going to increase taxes, uh, property taxes uh, in the future and we don't even know the economic situation in the future. Well, one thing, I, when, it, when you look at that, I wasn't, this is just a projection, and we're projecting that our revenues are going to actually go down um, so that it would be providing the services that we're providing right now is how do we recover those services if we provided the same services that we're providing. It doesn't mean that in years 2013, 2014, or 2015 that we don't cut services or cut other things to so there is not a tax increase. Um, but this is just a projection if revenues stay the same. The converse would be true is that should revenues um, increase, you know, sales tax, what have you, or our, you know, the, the tax base increase by um, corporations or businesses coming in here and becoming more valuable, then uh, it would, may not necessitate an increase in taxes. That's, in fact, Mr. Chairman, I was looking at the, uh, the four scenarios that were given us, and I think it's just Commissioner Privet's concern, I hear what he's saying, and I think because you look down below with the budget expenditures, you don't see any great big increase in anything. <coughs> you see some decreases, in fact, over the next five years. But the big thing that jumps out at you on the revenue side is the fact that we're projecting the next reval, something we haven't seen in this county, I guess, in any time in, in the history. Yeah. And that's a projecting a actually loss of value in real property in two years when we do the reval. Now, my hope is, is that our we hit the boom times again and turns that around so that we don't see that 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 negative number which in is about eight million dollars it shows here that we're projecting in two years is a loss of value overall revenue from reval that that would that number would turn around and <coughs> restore because that i think that's what's driving the whole thing right there is looking at the decreased value in our property i think it's something that people would understand is that we talk about revenue neutral tax rate we've always talked about it going down being less than the current tax rate, but we could have the situation the next rebound where the revenue neutral tax rate is actually higher than what it is right now, which I don't think would sit well with a lot of folks. So, <laughs> what is the is any further discussion? Well, I would add to what Commissioner Mike said, and, I, and I'm giving out this by saying it because it's been a, for me kind of a seesaw back and forth because on one hand. You know, we have some. We our staff has done performed above and beyond, and uh, I would hate to. You know, we have a personnel ordinance in place that says this is what we do to fund, you know, merit increases. But I'm also struggling with that the fact that we do have most companies out there, most organizations are not dealing with a merit increase or pay raises. Now the cola, I can understand the cola because of just keeping up with what's going on overall with the general increase in prices and the general increase in cost of living. But I'm having, you know, I'm the same way with uh, this Commissioner Mine. I think if we, we're having a rough time <coughs> of funding the merit system this year, and I'd like for us to actually even take a look at how we do that in the future. Uh, you know, this board look at it in the next couple of months, but I, I would be, agree with her that I think that we need to keep the COLA in place, but go with the... Uh, uh, not provide a merit increase this year. Any other discussions? Do we have a motion? 
I think we're going to have a public hearing. hearing. Oh, excuse me, we have to have a public hearing. <laughs> Thank you for reminding me. Okay. <laughs> Commissioner Poole. I'll open this up for public hearings. Does anybody want to speak for or against the budget as it has been presented? Seeing none, I'll close it for public hearing. Now, do we have a motion? <laughs> just wanted to give a courtesy reminder there are three ordinances that we need to adopt. We have the ordinance for the, the county budget, for the general fund, Cabarrus Arena and Event Center Fund, Landfill Fund, 911 Fund, and Workers' Compensation and Health Insurance Fund, uh, and then a motion to adopt the, or the right now is to consider adopting the 2011 budget ordinance for the special fire and service districts tax fund and consider a motion to adopt the 2011 budget ordinance for the capital improvements project. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we approve the, uh, the general fund budget uh, with the changes that were noted in our agenda packet, uh, plus to include uh, reducing the uh, merit increase portion of the employee uh, uh, pay uh, and that money would be put in the commissioner's contingency budget until we can determine what we're exactly where we'd like to allocate it. Um, so that would be uh, again to prove it with the changes that were proposed to us, plus uh, reducing the merit by additional three hundred fifty thousand dollars, zeroing it out, and uh, put, placing that money in the commissioner's contingency budget. Okay. I and second the, that. Okay. What we have of the motion before us is. <laughs> to adopt the, I just wanted to uh, suggest that you also add uh, in this ordinance that you're suspending uh, the yep. merit plan and because, it, the because that's yeah. another ordinance yep, that somewhere is, else. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So for, and we're for suspending, that. 11, yeah, suspending the increase the, the merit policy. Yeah, in the personnel ordinance for this year. Okay, if everybody will have patience with me. We have a motion before us to adopt the fiscal year 2011 Cabarrus County budget ordinance with the modification of the merit pay uh, being moved over to the commissioner's contingency fund in the amount of approximately $350,000. The Cabarrus Arena and Events Center Fund, Landfill Fund, 911 Telephone Fund, and the Workers' Compensation and Health Insurance Fund, and along with suspending the merit uh, personnel policy ordinance okay along with a motion to adopt well let's do that one okay <laughs> we have a motion and we have a second as it relates to that is there any further is there any clarification that the, this board needs with my recitation of the motion okay this is this is ju this motion is only to the first number three Okay. Yes, we have including the, the Arena and Event Center, Landfill, 911. Yes, comp. with the modification as I presented, or as, as the motion was, is to um, transfer the merit pay increase to the Commissioner's Contingency Fund in an approximation of $350,000. And then at the very end of that would be to suspend the merit personnel policy ordinance. Is that correct? Is that the right language? Right, and that would probably go on under Section 3 in that list of all the specifications. <coughs> yes, Mrs. Dubois. Do that with the merit. You need to do that also to the arena fund and the landfill fund because they also have merit in them. We can okay. make adjustments and can't tell you what that number is. But okay. Okay. Yeah. And let me restate the motion so everybody knows what they're voting on <laughs> or voting against. Uh, this is a motion to adopt the FY 2011 Cabarrus County Budget Ordinance for the General Fund with the modification of changing the merit pay, which will be transferred to the Commissioner Contingency Fund in approximation of $350,000. And that would also include a modification as it relates to the merit pay for the Cabarrus Arena and Event Center Fund the landfill fund, the 911 telephone fund, and the workers' compensation and health insurance fund, along with a motion, and the motion would also include suspension of the merits policy, merit personnel policy ordinance, 
as it relates to each one of those funds. Does everybody, is there any clarification that anybody needs? We have a motion, we have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. aye. Motion carries 3-2. Next matter we have is, uh, do we have a motion to adopt the 2011 budget ordinance for special fire and service districts tax fund? Move it be approved, Mr. Chairman. We have a motion, we have a second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? That motion carries 5-0. Next is a motion to adopt the 2011 budget ordinance for the capital improvements project. Do we have a motion? So moved. We have a second. A second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? The motion carries. The next that we have is G2, is the CDBG scattered site rehabilitation public hearing for closeout of grant. Mrs. Sifford. As I stated in the agenda session, we completed seven full rehabs and six urgent repair projects uh, under this grant. We expended $374,484.19. Are there any questions? Uh, just one question, Mr. Chairman. For uh, we have um, those rehabilitation. Were some of those done by? I know Carolina Cross Connection has been actively working some in this area as well. Do they do any of those, or is that mainly just private contractors do that? We use private contractors for that because almost every job is structural in nature. Okay, so, so we like to have a license <laughs> and insurance and <laughs> whatnot for that. <laughs> um, we have been working uh, some with Carolina Cross Connections and giving them references for wheelchair ramps and some things like that, and they have approached us approached us about doing some work under the uh, HCCBG and I'm doing a little research now on that okay. and maybe uh, us buying materials and them doing some of the projects for us but we're, we're researching the details on that right now. Uh, just a point of order uh, Mr. Chairman uh, because Carolina Cross Connection recently relocated their headquarters from Lincolnton to uh, Concord so they are now based here. So it's, uh, okay. So. Any other questions for Mrs. Sifford? This does not require any action, just to have a hearing to gather input, correct? Yes, sir. Okay. I will open it up for a public hearing to receive input as it relates to the scattered site rehabilitation uh, closeout of the grant. Seeing nobody coming forward, I will close the matter for hearing, and there is no further action that this board needs to take as it relates to this matter. Next is G3 is reservation of capacity certificate for Forest Park Crossing apartment project. Mrs. Morris. This is a reservation of capacity uh, certificate request for Fort Forest Park Crossing. Um, as we talked about at the work session, it's a 56 unit multifamily project located uh, in the city of Kannapolis. They are requesting their reservation of capacity um, capacity is not available at all of the schools, so they would be asked to uh, be subject to the phasing schedule that the ordinance sends out and as well as the uh, voluntary mitigation payment. Uh, the information was in your packets. The applicant is requesting to have the timing uh, changed. They would like to be able to pull all 56 permits and they would like to pay up front for those permits. Uh, prior to doing that and not be subject to the phasing schedule. Um, Mrs. Duesenberry is here to answer any questions that you have about the project or if you're interested in understanding why they're asking uh, for for that type of arrangement instead of the build-out schedule. Okay. Any questions for Mrs. Morris at this time? Anybody would uh, need any questions for Mrs. Duesenberry? Do we have a motion to uh, approve the reservation of capacity certificate and authorize the county commerce department com commerce director to execute the certificate on behalf of the county pursuant to the request of Forest Park Crossing Apartments, which would be paying everything up front. So moved. We have a motion. We have a second. We have some discussion. Commissioner okay. Privet. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. <coughs> I notice in the uh, adequacy determination. The point is made, adequate school capacity does not 
exists for this multifamily project at the uh, elementary, immediate, and high school. So uh, we're getting in the same problem of uh, providing uh, projects and we do not have school facilities uh, to do so. Thank you, Commissioner Privet. We have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed? Aye. Motion carries 4-1. Next matter we have is G4, which is the potential locations of the new county office space for the following county departments, Board of Elections, Transportation, Veteran Services, Parks Administration, and EMS. Mr. Downs. As the board discussed at the work session, there was, there was multiple proposals brought to this, the county staff for potential locations. At that time, the board narrowed it to two locations, which were the seventh floor of the Sheriff's Administration Building and the creamery, the old creamery building located at, on Church Street. Uh, since that time, we did have one additional, one of the other proposals did lower their, their cost, and that was submitted to you, you guys. That was, should be in your uh, supporting information that was passed on to you this afternoon. Uh, but I'm here to answer any questions. The, the purchase that the board requested that on the uh, old creamery site, uh, uh, the original proposal was for a lease, and they requested a purchase proposal as well, and that, that's before you as well. Uh, Mr. Morrison and, and, uh, is here to answer any questions that you may have concerning their, their proposal, whether it be the lease or the purchase. Uh, the seventh, and that would be only to relocate the Board of Elections. Uh, the seventh floor of the Sheriff's Department, you could relocate everybody except for transportation. You would not be able to re relocate them. <laughs> Uh, simply because of the parking requirements and of the secure parking for the vans and the number of vans that we would need as well. So those are the two options that you have before you. I, I, I can answer any questions that you've come up with since our work session that you may have. If not, we would hope that the board has a recommendation for the staff <laughs> on how for, we should proceed with this. It's been questions a long project. Do we have any questions for Mr. Downs? You said earlier that the that when you and I were talking that basically that all of the departments pretty much their leases are still current in their current locations. There's not anybody that's coming up for an next. No, I think we've got another year and year and a half on transportation where they're at. We would have to renew that in the in the upcoming years. Okay, so everybody else is. And everybody else, we we own the the property. Okay, so well, then, well, then. we own we own EMS stations and we own the Parks and Rec building as well. Because it appears to me the challenge, even here, seventh, either seventh floor of the sheriff's office would not accommodate transportation. That's correct. Um, the property, the Morrison property, was just for the Board of Elections, so nothing would change other than the Board of Elections wouldn't be moving out of their building. That's correct. Okay. With the proposal that has been given to us, um, in regards to the purchase of the old creamery building or the creamery building, um, how do you, how do we address if we were to purchase it? Paragraph two, where it says what the purchase price is, and then the cost to improve the building to buyer specifications based on preliminary design concepts. The cost is approximately six hundred thousand. A couple of questions is one: what if it ends up being four hundred thousand? It, it would be a direct price. cost. It would be a direct cost of the of the work. And second is, um, how do we, how, how do you, how would the county properly deal with um, engaging the architect that uh, Morrison Company has recommended or required, as well as the contractor under the laws of North Carolina? I, I do not think that it's a requirement that we use. Well, it says right here, seller will engage blank architect and this construction that would company. That would be if they perform the work themselves. Okay. Okay. Yeah, they, there, there are two options there. We could purchase the building outright for 837500 We hire our own architect and do our own upfit. Uh, the Morrisons feel that they have an architect on site already uh, that knows the, the property, knows the buildings, and, and also a contractor that's there as well. They they feel that as a private company, they can do it. They they can do it much quicker, and, and they feel that they can do it cheaper as well. 
but that that's still an option. We have both options as the county. We can go with our own architect that we've already engaged, or we can we can move forward with with the ones that are already on site at the creamery. Okay. Any other questions for Mr. Downs? Clarify if we if we vote to to move to the creamery, that the decision as to how we would go with the architect and construction would come in further discussions. We're not voting if if we vote right now to move to go with the creamery location. Um, we would be discussing how we would upfit that property at a later time. Or That's later. correct. The, the, what's in the proposal the is, is, is just a schematic drawing <clears throat> that uh, the Morrisons uh, have come up with. That is not exactly the, the, the uh, layout that we would agree to at this time. We, we've not really looked that closely to it. It's, but it is, it is a layout that would work based on the square footage and the cost per square footage would, should not vary too much from what they're, what they're using as a, as a multiplier as well. The, the question you would have is, do you want to use the old creamery for the Board of Elections? The other question is, do the architect and the contractor? Of course, that's totally up to the Board. And, and yes, you could discuss that at another meeting. Yeah, that's yeah. true. <laughs> I think I know this by now, ten, doing this for 10 years. Um, so what we would be doing is we tonight would really just be purchasing it for the purchase price of 837000 and then we would negotiate then whether or not we wanted them to. Well, no, because if if you want the them to do, it. to do the work, it has to be included in the purchase price because then we run into that problem that the chairman was raising. So if 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 that group is going to do the work and we're going to buy a building that has already been, been upfitted, upfitted then that would all be reflected in, in the purchase price. So the motion should be that we we are would be voting to move the elect board of elections into the old creamery building with the negotiations for uh, lease or purchase and upfitting to be done. You could do that with, between the parties. Sure. Right, not That's my motion. Them. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Now the question I've got, and I'll second that where we can continue our discussion, but uh, the, sec the question I've got is, is that, of course, that the space upstairs in the courthouse, I mean in the sheriff's building, is 19,000 square feet approximately. Yes, yes sir. And that, that would include everybody up there except for transportation. That's correct. So that would be the other three or four departments. So we would be the... Uh, that, that would include... The other four departments that we listed, and there would be, there should be some additional square footage left over that we would have the potential to move some of the state off. Oh, okay. Over as well. Okay, so we would not take up that full 19,000 yeah, square no. feet. And, so and the other option would be, you could just develop or just upfit that portion and not have the extra expense of that extra square footage upfit, if or we, you could do it and do it and use it for additional space. I know that we've been presented with, you know, basically all 10,000 square feet at the creamery being creamery building being board of elections. That's but correct. is it possible to put any of the other departments we have in there as well with the Board of Elections, or is that going to be pretty tight? <laughs> Based on the requested square footage okay. from the Board of Elections yeah. and the, the director there, we're at our limits right there. It's actually less than what was than what was going to be used in the building that we were designing ourselves. Right, so you'll recall that there were schematics done yeah, um, and a, that. A space yeah. needs analysis done. Because my concern with them going upstairs is that we're, and we say we can do it, we can handle it, but it's just one of the, you know, it's going to cause, I think, a lot of animosity publicly with those that are working the polls, those that, you know, that, because you have them upstairs, even if we were to put an early voting site down here in the rotunda or whatever, it would still split up their operations yes, and I think the more difficult you get logistically not saying it happens in elections but there's more rise to accusations of chicanery and things like that going on between parties so I mean I have a tendency to support the idea you know that, that I, I hate it that we're not going to be able to we still have to deal with the office space for the remainder of those other four departments but you know and I know though that the Board of Elections supports the Creamery site I believe the director also supports the Korean site, yes, for the Korean site, because of the one level easy access, the, part, the adequate parking that exists over there. Right. 
Well, the parking doesn't exist unless we put it in, according to their note here. It says the 837, 837 includes the shell of the building and the seller's obligation to finish additional parking, okay. site lighting, and sidewalks in back. What you've got the attached site plan there? Page 262. So there, there is, there is uh, property parking and parking lights included in that price. The only thing left on the parking that would be that is if um, we would need to come up with a, a formal agreement to allow the rest of the property to use our driveway coming in and as well as us using their driveways and their interests coming in. And then in times of, of a larger need for parking that we would agree to allow each, uh, uh, each party to, to use the additional parking. When I'm looking at the third page, I don't see any exit from the um, parking lot. I just see one entrance and one exit. There is. Look at the picture on the page 262 shows you the a different layout than I think the one you're looking at. Yeah, we got it outlined in red. How do you get? It's currently. Oh, so there's a drive there. Yeah, okay. The okay, I didn't. I guess I'm getting old. I can't see that well. <laughs> okay. All right. Commissioner Privet, what are your thoughts about this? Um, well, number one, Mr. Chairman, it looks like to me it's bad public policy that here we're going to go out and purchase a building while we already have uh, facilities available. And uh, it's just, uh, we talk about the economic climate situation we're in, and uh, then we're going to say to the taxpayers, we're going out and, and buy another building when we have facilities we can take care of the needs that we have. I'd like to make a comment on that is that this facility, if you're referring to the top floor of the sheriff's building, I think um, when you consider who would be using it and the access and the traffic in that area and the lack of parking close to that uh, facility, people going back and forth at times uh, in that busy and dangerous intersection. I just don't think that that the seventh floor is suitable for the Board of Elections um, at all. I mean, it just doesn't seem to be be the suitable space. Um, well, I lean, I still lean towards the seventh floor. Um, I think uh, primarily what I'm looking at is budget reasons. Um, we can accommodate more spaces. We could sell the parks building, which would bring in um, funds. I don't know how much it's it's valued at somewhere, two fifty to three hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. We would. I just I honestly believe that with the when the um, the jail over here is torn down, the board of elections building is torn down, that there are going to be additional parking spaces available and that we could uh, work out an arrangement down, either downstairs in the rotunda um, or over there uh, in the lobby area with, with security to be able to provide a, um, voting sites. And, um, you know, they, I just think that the seventh floor space makes more sense financially at this point in time uh, than to just move the Board of Elections and only the Board of Elections into the the new facility. So um, I would go with Commissioner Privet on using the seventh floor. Any further discussion? We have a motion and we have a second. The motion is to, um, let me get this right here, motion to purchase the old creamery building for a sum not to exceed uh, Eight hundred and thirty-seven thousand five hundred dollars. Is that correct, Commissioner? Mining. Is that your right. intention? Um, 
Board. I, I thought I thought the motion was just to uh, vote to move oh, the Board of Elections. Excuse me, move the Board of Elections. To, I'm sorry. Uh, right. That building and then negotiate the and price and conditions and terms. Right. Okay. okay. The motion is to move the Board of Elections <laughs> to the old Creamery building with further negotiations concerning the purchase price. That's a seconded by Commissioner Carruth. Uh, any further discussion? Uh, one, one last thing, Mr. Chairman, just point out is that in our capital improvement budget for this next year, we, we did approve in part of that budget up to, I think, $2 million for uh, office space. So that is within that, that budget amount, budgeted amount, what they're proposing. And it still leaves us some money if we need, use that other remaining money even to do some additional upfit. Yeah, they will, well, there'll be some additional costs for furniture and, right, right. and equipment and so, stuff, but it still should still be yeah. well within the budget. We have a motion and we have a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Aye. Motion carries 3-2. Next matter, um, I believe that con concludes all the new business that we have. Uh, under H-1 is the appointment of the Adult Care Home Advisory or Home Community Advisory Committee. Uh, do we have a motion to adopt, to reappoint Mr. Ed Burns to the Adult Care Home Community Advisory Committee for a three year term ending May 31st, 2013, and reappoint Karen Penskin to a three year term ending June 30th, 2013, including an exception to the length of service provision of the appointment policy and remove Velika Johnson from the roster? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Motion carries. I would call very close attention to this. This is a very important committee that I'd ask um, people to certainly consider um, uh, serving on. Next is the Cabarrus County Tourism Authority. Um, we have before us under the Cabarrus County Tourism Authority recommendation is three names is Philip Cunningham, Alice, Alan Cress, and Doug Stafford. The CBB has uh, requested that we appoint Philip Cunningham. And appointing Philip Cunningham, if we were to do so, he does not live in the county, but he is the manager of the Great Wolf Lodge, Resort Lodge. Um, the, you know, so that, that's in regards to his seat. The Chamber of Commerce has submitted to us Alan Cress, Philip Cunningham, and Doug Stafford with requesting Alan Cress. And I think we've already selected that. Is that correct? Our, our selection has already been selected, which is Mrs. Scott. It, it was discussed as part of the motion. Okay. Okay. I move that we re reappoint Mr. Cress to seat number nine on the Cabarrus County Tourism Authority for a year term. Uh, and we appoint Mr. Phil Cunningham to seat number eight. Uh, term to expire June 30, 2013. That, it, that would also include an exception to the residency provision due to his uh, official position at Great Wolf Lodge. And then reappoint uh, Noel Scott is the large uh, seat, seat number seven. And her term would also end June 30, 2013. We have motions, and do we have a second for each one of those motions? Second. We have any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Next is the Central Line of Workforce Development Board. Uh, do we have a motion to reappoint Mr. Bob Van Gordon to the Central Line of Workforce Development Board as a private sector representative for a two-year term ending June 30, 2012, including an exception to the appointment policy, and to appoint Milton Chickas to the Central Line of Workforce Development Board as a private sector representative for a two-year term ending June 30, 2012, and Lisa Conger as the education representative to complete an unexpired term ending June 30th, 2011. Move. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed? Motion carries. Next is the Harrisburg Fire Advisory Board. Uh, do we have a motion to reappoint Graydon, I'm sorry, Mr. Chinonsky, Ch Chonsky? <laughs> I apologize <laughs> to the Harrisburg Fire Advisory Board for a two-year term ending June, July 1st, 2012. We have a motion to reappoint. We have a motion. We have a second. Second. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Under the Juvenile Crime Prevention Council, we have a motion to reappoint Mrs. Megan Bumgardner as the uh, 
District Attorney Designee and Eddie Moss at large to the JCPC for two year term two year terms ending June 30, 2012, and appointing Mr. Mark and Tos and Tozik, thank you, at large, and Gina Hampton, a student under 18 years old, to the JCPC for a two-year term ending June 30, 2012, including an exception to the service on multiple boards provision for Mr. Antozik, and remove Mr. Chris Abbey's and Jerry Sigmund's name from the roster and thank them for their service. Do we have a motion? So moved. Do we have a second? Second. We have a motion. We have a second. May I make a comment quickly? Certainly. Um, I know in past years um, the board, and this has been a while, was was very much attuned to the idea of not appointing people to multiple boards, um, and also with the um, residency, which comes up again in a couple of these other ones. Um, and when we have, if we ha if we have applications on file, then um, I would like to suggest that. Um, we take a closer look at making sure that we have residents and um, some of these names show up on a couple different areas I don't know the people in particular or personally but um, you know when we have m multiple people that are trying to get on commissions um, I think we need to make an effort not to point people to multiple boards or um, we also need to make an effort to make sure that they live in the county not just work in the county so just a general comment I don't have a problem with these people being appointed but just a general comment that I'd like to see us kind of work towards. Okay. We have a motion. We have a second. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Under the Piedmont Area Mental Health, Mental Retardation, and Substance Abuse Authority, we have a motion to reappoint uh, Tano Hartzell to the Piedmont Area Mental Health, Mental Retardation, and Substance Abuse Authority for a four-year term ending June 30, 2014. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. We have a motion and we have a second. All in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. Motion carries. Under the Public Health Authority of Cabarrus County, um, do we have a motion to appoint? Uh, this is the Health Alliance. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, this was a seat that has been held for, uh, well, that has been served for a, a number of years now for a person that was not on this board of commission, but it was outside this board of commission. Uh, we have we that term expires June 30th, 2010, and we're now at a point to move forward and, and designate one of the commissioners to sit on the board. And I'm not certain what the pleasure of this board is as to um, the meetings. The meetings are held on the second Tuesday of every month at 5:30 p.m. I believe. Um, First meeting it looks like is August the 10th, 2010, and, and it goes forward, goes forward from there, uh, and it's held at the boardroom of the Cabarrus County Human Services Building. Um. <clears throat> Mr. Chairman, we don't have a commissioner sitting on this board currently, do we? No, sir, we don't. And that's and, what and we course, talked about in, in, in our budget yeah, is that we the, need to have uh, a commissioner. We've had a lot of questions about the uh, the Health Alliance, its future, buildings, and what have you, and we've had nobody to give us any input. Kind of left us in the dark. That's what we're trying to rectify tonight, so that yeah. we can get one of us appointed um, to serve on that. And I think it I think it would be good to to one of us to serve on that. And I didn't know what the pleasure is of this board. I would certainly I don't I would like to serve on it. I I think it's something that's important that that we um, ha have it at meeting and have that re uh, input and also bring it back to this board so that we can understand what's going on because there's, I think there's a lot of things that uh, Dr. Pilkington is doing uh, and that board is doing for the, for the good of Cabarrus County. Unfortunately, we have not been able to hear about all the good things they're doing and vice versa is that they have not heard some of the concerns that we have um, on you know various areas. But I think I think it's important that we do that, and I I would I would like to serve one of this. If, if you're willing to serve, I'll make that nomination, <laughs> Mr. Chairman. <laughs> we have a, a motion to adopt to appoint myself. Do we have a second? Second. <laughs> we have a motion. We have a second. Any further discussion? All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Next matter we have is the CJPP as opposed to the JCPC. <laughs> Under the 
criminal justice partnership program. We have a motion to appoint uh, Dr. Pilkington and Benita McGuine uh, to serve to the CJPP uh, board for three-year term ending June 30, 2013. So moved, Mr. Chairman. Second. We have a motion. We have a second. All in favor, say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. And now under the Transportation Advisory Board. Uh, we have a motion to reappoint Julia Patterson, Janet Purser, Justin Brines, Sharon Corpinger, or excuse me, Corpinen, Corpine, Corpinen, uh, Tony Harris, and Ben Warren to the Transportation Advisory Board for three-year terms ending June 30, 2013, including an exception policy to the residency provision of the appointment policy for Mrs. Patterson, Mrs. Caldwell, Mrs. Corpenning, Mr. Harris, and Mr. Warren, and an exception to the length of service provisions for Mr. Mrs. Caldwell and Mrs. Purser. Do we? I make the motion, and this was the one that concerned me the most, mm -hmm. that we have. Um, I know a number of these people, and I know that they work in Cabarrus County and do everything they can for Cabarrus County, so I don't have a concern about their commitment from to the county, but there's four, one, two, three, four, five of them for length of service and, wait a minute, five for residency and two of them for length of service. Length of service doesn't bother me near as much as um, it would be nice to have Cabarrus County residents. I think most of these people, though, are appointed more so based on their jobs mm -hmm. than based on the fact that they live in Cabarrus County, so I don't have a problem with that being the case, but just to point out that a lot of these people are, are not residents of Cabarrus County. So I would, I would make the motion to appoint or reappoint. That, that's one of the things that, that is very difficult uh, in some of these boards, not all of them, but some of the boards, is that by law we're required to have certain sectors mm -hmm. Represent um, yep. representative. And, you know, that's unfortunately, you know, who we have, we, you know, um, whether it's whatever the provision is or whatever the sector is, sometimes we don't have the luxury of them living in Cabarrus County. Well, one thing we have is, uh, like for instance, there's a good example when is that Tony Harris is on that board. He's a county safety and risk manager, and I would think that this is a critical position when we're dealing with the, because you're dealing with the our specialized transport service, which is a huge liability uh, risk for the county. Um, that whole service is a tremendous amount of exposure. So it's very important to have, you know, if you're not going to have him because he doesn't live in Cabarrus County, then who would you put on there that would be better representative of to look out for safety and risk issues mm -hmm. right. for the organization? And, and I agree completely. Yeah. On mm -hmm. this particular board, right. they're on there because of their jobs. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but I do think that on some of the other boards oh, that are not as critical for their jobs or um, to have somebody serve on two different boards, that I'd like to see us to try to, to, I mean, this is a way of soliciting more people to try to apply to be on the boards, which you will do in a minute at the end of the meeting because you do it every month. Um, but it's just an encouragement for people to become more active in the community, care more about the local community that they're in, and to be involved in that local community through these many different um, boards that we have available um, for service. And I would hope that more and more people would take that seriously. And a second. Uh, to appoint or reappoint those that are referenced. All in favor say aye. 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 All opposed. Motion carries. Next matter that I call to the Board of Commissioners, and I believe this information is on our website, is the Harrisburg Area Land Use Plan progress reports. Uh, those were, I think they've been updated on our website to, uh, to I encourage everybody to look at it. There was some good discussion. A couple of weeks ago there was um, a good meeting with uh, various uh, uh, participants, the, and I think that will be now taken to, Ms. Morris has already left, that will be now taken to the, uh, for a, a public hearing to, to go over it. We've gotten in public input, plans were created, and uh, we've, I would encourage everybody to look at them. And Commissioner Poole is correct, I do have uh, uh, a request out to everybody to look over and um, look over the different boards. There is a special request for the Mount Plan Pleasant Planning Board and Board of Adjustment, uh, and also the Planning and Zoning Commission. Uh, I would ask that you 
seriously look at it and consider um, appointing. Last month we had the uh, Food Policy Council, which we which would had great representation and opportunity. And in fact, uh, we've got some good reports after the first meeting. And I would encourage everybody to look at it because I think there is many boards here that, that would suit a lot of people's interests and uh, desires to, to help and to, to work within the county. With that, uh, do we have any comments from the board members? Mr. Chairman, just a couple comments, if I could. Uh, earlier this evening, I know that we had some folks here that were concerned about um, the aftermath involving the uh, the uh, dog that was slain in, in, back in April, um, and there were some comments made about the Animal Preservation Protection Task Force. Uh, I have been in contact with the chairman of that group, and we are right now tentatively planning a meeting for the next three to four weeks uh, to get together to talk about uh, some of the things that have surfaced as a result of the investigation that was completed. I will point out to the public that that group only meets pretty much when it needs to meet. It's not a regularly scheduled group that meets once a month because there's not on a month-to-month -month basis business to discuss uh, in relation to that. Uh, it is made up of several animal rescue uh, representatives from several animal rescue organizations in the county. These organizations probably have rescued well over thousands of animals in this community over the last 10 years. And I think uh, Commissioner Poole, when she had her kennel, some of them come to her for donating kennel space uh, for these rescued animals. Um, the, uh, that group also uh, is already had, been, had some discussions about how do we reduce the euthanasia rate because it is too high. Uh, we are uh, extremely high in this county, and but the question comes down is how much, you know, what do we need to do to, to change that? And, uh, I think that that's something that has already been discussed and informally in that group and will continue to be discussed. And I'm not sure if anybody on the board wants anything in particular, feedback from the board, from that board, that committee on anything other than how do we prevent something that the action that occurred, how do we prevent it from happening again if it can be prevented from happening again? Commissioner Monick? Uh Yes, I just want to report that. Uh, Fortunately, a year passed, a year ago, I had a terrible announcement about our personal business and about the danger of losing 50 families' jobs in this community with the closing of Ben Minot Chevrolet Cadillac, and it was reinstated. We celebrated that event on Saturday, and uh, on behalf of all of those employees who stuck with us through that entire year, um, and the community, which rose in an extraordinary way to support us, we can never repay that. And uh, so 50 families now are going to continue to move on and uh, be able to pay their whole house mortgages and buy things in this community. And so I just want, on their behalf and on my personal behalf, I'd like to appreciate, show my appreciation to this community. Good. Thank you. With that, uh, we have a motion to go into closed session to discuss the location or expansion of business or industry served by the public body, including agreement on a tentative list of economic development incentives that may be offered by the public body in negotiations. We have, we have a motion. We have a second. We have all in favor say aye. Aye. All opposed. With that, we will, after that closed session, we will be adjourning uh, for next month. So hope everybody has a safe night. Thank you.